Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, Oklahoma is a land of abundance, yet when it comes to the food on our children's school lunch plates, very little of it is from around here. Today, we're going to take a look at the issue as well as meet some people working to solve it. It's pretty good. In our Oklahoma Standard, we recognize a company that helps student organizations around the state. Plus, we'll also visit a farmer's market that is completely student-run. We are growing our own vegetables out in the garden. And then it's time for some fun. We'll take you to the American Banjo Museum in Oklahoma City's Bricktown, and then we will end our day in southeastern Oklahoma looking for Bigfoot. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, we have come a long way since the days when ketchup was considered a vegetable on our children's school lunch plates. Today's school lunches are not only more nutritious, they're also more locally grown thanks to a program called Farm to School. As our Lisa Hines reports, the Farm to School program not only exposes children to locally grown meat and produce, it also gives state farmers a new marketing avenue. Fresh fruit is on the menu. We are having Oklahoma grown watermelon that we get through the Farm to School program. Krista Neal is the Nutrition Services Director at Stillwater Public Schools and says fresh fruits and vegetables just taste better. Yeah, I think there's a difference when the food is locally grown, especially with our cantaloupe and our watermelon. We get the nicest, freshest fruit when we get things that are grown in Oklahoma. It's pretty good. Middle school student Eli Parsons thinks so too. Katie Strack is the program coordinator for the Oklahoma Farm to School program and says the program is beneficial to both farmers and schools. Farm to School is really important because it provides farmers an opportunity to sell their produce to the schools and the schools to serve fresh local produce to the kids. And Katie says if it tastes good, the kids will eat healthier. Well, we all know that childhood obesity is a big issue, um, both within our state as well as nationwide. And Farm to School provides the ability to serve local produce to the kids so that they have um, fresher options, healthier options. Local produce just tastes better because it's fresher. Um, we all know that tasting a tomato out of the garden versus something that's been shipped from miles and miles away, there's a world of difference in that. And the kids taste that too. There's endless health benefits to eating local produce. We have more nutrients um, because it's picked and it's fresher. Um, it's not sitting on the store shelves and ripening there or ripening in a truck. Um, and so, you know, we're able to get those nutrients into the kids a lot easier that way. According to Krista, the program helps the kids know how their food is grown. We know kids will eat better if they know where the food comes from. If you grow it, you eat it. And if we can get kids to learn that food comes from dirt, <laughs> food comes from the ground, food comes from that school garden or that farm down the road, um, if, they, if we can get them to try things that they grew or that they know where it came from, they'll eat more fruits and vegetables, they'll eat more produce, and that will help them have healthier weights and healthier eating habits. And could even affect the eating habits of their whole family. If the kids are seeing that produce on their tray at school, they'll hopefully go home and tell mom and dad about it, and then they can go to that farmer's market and maybe buy from the exact same farmer that's supplying to the school. So it's a really a win-win-win for everyone. Taking food from the farm directly to the school to get that taste of fresh grown. Now we do have a link to the Farm to School website. Just go to okhorizon.com and look for it under this story. Well, the USDA has named Oklahoma a national leader in the effort to improve student access to free and reduced price school meals. Oklahoma is one of six states to receive the distinction that removes much of the paperwork and hassle that local school districts have had to juggle in the past. 
Well, a little later in our show, we head down to the American Banjo Museum in Oklahoma City's Bricktown for a little picking and a grinning. But when we return, we visit a company that's been helping students for over 40 years in our Oklahoma standard. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, for over 40 years, the Blue and Gold Sausage Company has been producing sausage that not only tastes great, but gives student organizations a way to raise money. In this week's Oklahoma Standard, our Andy Barth takes us for a peek into a day in the life of Blue and Gold Sausage. As morning begins in Jones, Oklahoma, work at the Blue and Gold Sausage Company is already underway. For the first 30 years of our existence, it was all sausage that we created here. We still create all the sausage here. Brett Ramsey is the second generation to run the company and says his family's product is one of a kind. Part of it has to do with the attention to detail in terms of putting together a wholesome product. We have always been very judicious about how we build product, but in terms of food safety and wholesomeness and consistency, I think that probably is, is a place where we add value that uh, makes us stand out a little bit. Production of Blue and Gold Sausage is seasonal, and Ramsey says when it's sausage season, it's all hands on deck. When we're busy, we ha we'll have 40, 45 people uh, employed here, either on the production line or uh, handling product on the docks or our drivers that are out uh, delivering product to our groups. And one of those drivers, James Zachary. Everybody seems to like our product. It's fresh. It's frozen this year, and everybody seems to enjoy that. They're not worried about it thawing out so fast before they get it delivered. Blue and Gold Sausage sells its product through youth organizations. And Ramsey says because their client base is so diverse, their drivers cover a lot of ground. Amarillo, Boyce City, just this side of Kansas City, Russellville in, Ar in uh, towards Arkansas. Um, that gets us into almost any of our groups that we want to. And today, Zachary's Travels takes him down the road to the El Reno FFA chapter. The students excitedly work together to unload their special orders. An annual tradition that FFA advisor Eric Bilderback says spans generations. Well, actually, when I was in high school, uh, as an FFA member here at El Reno, actually, um, we sold Blue and Gold Sausage. It was our major fundraiser and allowed us, when I was an FFA member, uh, to attend a variety of activities. And it does the same thing to our program, along with other programs around the, around the state. And Ramsey says they support groups like FFA because of the positive influence they offer to students. Here in Oklahoma, they're single-handedly creating um, the leadership that we need to move forward as a state. And aside from offering groups an easy fundraiser, Blue and Gold Sausage gives back to its customers by supporting their projects. A win-win for everyone. Our, our marketing and promotions campaign is almost too simple. We give money back to the groups that, uh, that, that help us make a living here, and, and we support them. And Builderback says Blue and Gold Sausage answers the call to curious consumer needs. The consumer, whether that consumer be here in Oklahoma or, or anywhere in the country, there's a need or, or they feel a need to know where their food comes from. And that is one thing that's very important about Blue and Gold Sausage is that the consumers or, or our customers, Blue and Gold's customers, one and the same, they, they know where their product, where their food comes from, where their product comes from. And that actually makes, the, makes it an easier fundraiser. And while fundraising is always good, FFA member Bree Elliott says the taste is what really counts. I love it. I look forward to this time of year every year. Blue and gold sausage, filling orders while fulfilling dreams. Blue and gold sausage, helping students for more than four decades, which makes them an Oklahoma standard. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, Look what's lurking in the woods of southeast Oklahoma. But first, learning lessons by growing things. 
Well, closing the gap between the people who grow our food and the people who eat it is especially hard in urban areas. That's why Metro Tech's Career Academy has started its own student-run farmer's market. Joining me now is our Lisa Hines. Farmers markets are becoming very popular around the U.S. as people are trying to eat fresh and healthy. At one school in Oklahoma City, students are hoping this craze will catch on in their area. With a scissor snip, the Metro Tech Career Academy Farmers Market is open for business. Jonah K. Squires is the horticulture instructor and says it's a typical farmers market. What you're seeing here today is the farmers market and we can't count on the weather. So we moved it inside and you're seeing vendors from all around the state of Oklahoma. Some have come as far as Duncan, Oklahoma to we have, I have former students that are here third generation agriculture producers. There's a gentleman over here, he's a lawyer by day, he's an agriculture farmer 24 hours a day. We kind of have a joke about that. Our students are having you know, their projects and the things that they've either grown in the garden as well as things they've done in the classroom. And Jonna Kay says it's that hands-on experience that helps the students really grasp the concept of entrepreneurship. I guess because for the students to learn, you know, it's, it's, it's just it's the whole opportunity. They get to put all of those things together. They get to actually go from production to consumption, become the business, the entrepreneur. They get to work side by side by other producers, entrepreneurs. We can talk about it all day long in the classroom. We can show them field trips, bring in guest speakers. But until they actually do it physically and understand all those components, they, they don't understand it and get it. And so I guess, be honest with you, we, you know, we felt like that was the best way for them to get it. And for our community, actually, economically, you know, we hope we're encouraging some other great things from it. Student Sawyer Austin loves the experience. We are growing our own vegetables out in the garden by the greenhouse. We propagated them and everything all on our own. It's taught me a lot about how to keep a garden up, what to use, what not to use, what not to do in a garden. And for student Evan Mander, it's teaching him how to keep things growing. I'm learning how to grow something and not kill it. Because I can kill, if you put a perfectly well plant in my hand, I could kill it just by looking at it. It gives me a responsibility to where I, like my cattle, I ha I'm responsible for them. If they don't have water, they don't live. If I don't feed them, they don't live. So it just builds more to where you have more responsibility when you get out of college and high school and you're, and you're in the adult world. Even though they've been preparing for this day, it's kind of surreal to the students. I don't think it, it's all come to them until today and being involved in it. And I, I'm curious to see that growth with them as we continue each one. Because I think some of them were nervous, some of them were scared. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of them are getting excited about um, what's going to be my job or can I help do this or, you know, do you want me doing this, this skill? So I, you're seeing their confidence build from that and you're seeing them understand that it's a lot bigger project, but they can actually give a lot more to it. and that they're open to a new experience. Thank you so much. Oops. Can't put a price tag on that. You know, that's that education by tuition, by learning, and I think that's the best part. And I think that's what Career Tech does really exceptionally well. We take all that cumulative book knowledge, technical knowledge, and we get to take it to a real experience and a real opportunity. And, and I'm passionate about that, and I'm passionate about the fact that, you know, agriculture, none of us can live without it. Got to have it every day. And, and that's the good thing I get to tell them. Everybody needs you, you know what I mean? Where would you be without it? So um, they get to be a part of that, and I think that takes that gives them that confidence and that gives them a skill set to really be able to achieve some pretty phenomenal things. And there is one very important reason to have the farmer's market at their school. There's an economic investment. There's a healthy food investment. And where this school and where we're at, we're in one of the worst zip codes in the state of Oklahoma. And that was kind of the thing that we talked about was our kids complain about our lunches. We complain about having healthy foods, but healthy foods that tasted good. And so that's kind of was the springboard for what kind of also helped to start the project. Healthy foods grown locally by local students. Come to our farmer's market every Friday from 10 to 2. So how did this get started? Well, the school applied for a $50,000 Cox Connects Community Impact Grant that's given annually. But the first year they applied for it, they were turned down. 
so they went back to the drawing board and came up with the farmer's market they now have, which includes an outdoor portable kitchen where visitors can sample the food grown and cooked right there at the school, which won them the grant the second try. Sounds good. All right, thank you so much, Elisa. You're welcome, Rob. Now, some of the people involved in the farmer's market are part of Metro Tech's dropout recovery program, and we have a full feature on that work being done to turn around young people's lives, streaming on our website at okhorizon.com. And I promise you, it's a story that will warm your heart. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, in the heart of downtown Oklahoma City, the American Banjo Museum attracts visitors from all over. And we were there as they celebrated their fifth anniversary. They're a picking and a grinning at the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. Well, we have the entire evolution of the banjo. The banjo as we know it started in America when African slaves brought it here in the mid-1600s. White people didn't start playing the banjo until about 200 years later. So the banjo has a great history in the African-American culture. And as it developed within the United States, the banjo became intertwined with popular music. As music evolved, the banjo evolved with it. We went through the period of minstrelsy to the classic period when guys played the banjo in concert halls to the jazz age of the Roaring Twenties when they were doing the Charleston and all that crazy dancing. Post-World War II, we had Earl Scruggs bring the banjo back to life with bluegrass. These days, you've got things like Mumford and Sons taking the banjo to a worldwide audience. It's an ongoing evolution, and we've kind of become the center of the banjo universe because we are embracing all things banjo. So how did Oklahoma become Banjo Central? Well, the banjo has no geographical center of its universe. So it wasn't born in Oklahoma City, it wasn't born in New Orleans, it wasn't born anywhere in particular. But Oklahoma has had a tradition of banjo with the Guthrie Jazz Banjo Festival that started back in the 90s. So a lot of attention was focused on Oklahoma City. And with a little help from a banjo enthusiast, Museum was born. Then there was a benefactor by the name of Jack Canine who had a banjo collection that he wanted to share with the public. So as part of the Guthrie Jazz Banjo Festival, he developed the infancy of this museum, let's put it that way, back in 1998. And from there we grew and grew and when it came time to look for a new home, we decided to stay in Oklahoma because that's where our, our identity came from. Now in the heart of Bricktown in Oklahoma City, you'll find the largest banjo collection on public display in the world. Over 300 instruments that span the ages. We have instruments from the 1840s that were there at the true infancy of when a banjo was being manufactured rather than a homemade instrument. A man named William Boucher in Baltimore made that transition. His banjos are so rare, it's beyond belief. We have the only Boucher banjo on exhibit. A significant piece of Americana with an even bigger story. And here you'll find instruments from the simple to the exquisite. They took the decorative excesses of the 1920s and applied them to the banjo in this model called the Big Chief. The back of the resonator is a Native American in full headdress. The carving on the side of the neck is a peace pipe, and the back of the peg head is carved in an eagle that spells out Ludwig Big Chief. And you don't have to be a banjo aficionado to enjoy the museum. If I say one name about the banjo that everyone recognizes, it's Earl, Earl Scruggs. Earl Scruggs is our first inductee into the five string category of the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame. 
and a favorite song? If there's any one song the people of the United States associate with a banjo, it's dueling banjos. Picking the strings on America's foremost foot stomping instrument here in the heartland. You can keep up with us throughout the week. Just head to OKRising.com where you can see more of any of our stories, read our reporters' behind the scenes blogs. See what others are saying about us on Twitter and face the facts with our regular updates. So reach out and touch us anywhere and anytime. Well, there are many a story about what lurks in the woods of southeastern Oklahoma, but probably none better than the one our Courtney May has. Honevi is a small community of just eight families, but for one weekend every fall, it becomes Bigfoot Central. Deep in the Kayamishi Mountains in southeast Oklahoma, the legend of a furry creature better known as Bigfoot is celebrated each year in the small town of Honubby, where some say Bigfoot is legend and others believe it's real. I decided to see if there were Bigfoot in Oklahoma. And I went to an area where I thought maybe they would be here. And I stayed in a hunting cabin and I did get visited that night. I heard the deep mumbling voices I heard their footfalls, uh, there, there was a stick dragging in the gravel, and I thought, well, what are, what are their plans with that? Farland Huff says this encounter is one of three he believes he has had. And world-renowned Bigfoot researcher Jeff Meldrum, who spoke at the festival, says southeast Oklahoma has the right qualities for this species to survive if, in fact, it does exist. This area has, has those those characteristics of, of climate and uh, habitat that uh, would uh, provide an opportunity for a primate like this to make a living. Yet whether or not this creature does exist, the annual Honubby Bigfoot Festival does, bringing in crowds of a thousand people to the small community and generating a lot of money. Right. Event coordinator Tom Hefner. The, this event is very, very important to the community itself. It brings a lot of people which spend money here, which we, we really need. We have actually have uh, people coming to our festival from all over the United States. From across the country, yet enjoying the same Bigfoot fun and local bands for the grown-ups. All fitting for royalty present. It is an honor to be a Miss Bigfoot. And we, we represent the people. Yes, we represent the people and we uphold the sash and the rules of wearing the sash. And we still run really the 5K. Well. Not quite as fast as we used to. I came but in fourth though today. I didn't even place, but. <laughs> Yet what is a Bigfoot festival without Bigfoot himself? <laughs> Head of security Artie Karn says there is no way the security team will let him get past them. Our job, security, is to make sure that Bigfoot does not come here and interrupt. And so far, nobody has seen him. We are doing a good job. We found Bigfoot. No Bigfoots come on the property. We did our job. I had a blast at the festival today. I've, I've uh, posed for numerous pictures with the kids and the family. And I've just walked up and down and showed off my Bigfoot strut. All right. And festival speaker Ron Moorhead says Southeast Oklahoma has plenty of Bigfoot witnesses. There's a lot of Bigfoots uh, reported here. A lot of creature uh, sightings, a lot of interaction going on. We got to see Bigfoot. And now count the people here today to that long list of witnesses because Bigfoot says they deserve it. Well, I've been hiding in the middle of the forest, obviously, and I wanted to come out today because of all these Bigfoot enthusiasts, they deserve to see a part of Bigfoot today. Yet at the Bigfoot Festival, whether someone is a believer, a witness, or just here to have fun, Hefner says the goal of the festival is the same, to raise money for local scholarships. We are trying to raise money to help students in the local area. That's our main thrust of this. And uh, we're trying to have a good time here at the festival and conference while we're doing that. I haven't found him in the woods yet, but one day I'm going to. <laughs> 
Well, certainly looks like a lot of fun. Oh, it was, and the people there are just great. So did you spot him? I didn't, and I only met a couple of people who say that they have, but whether real or not, the economic development surrounding the Bigfoot Festival certainly is. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, it's called STEM, a simple acronym for subjects that could determine our nation's future. Well, STEM is very important for Oklahoma because it's, it's our future. But we have to make sure that we have the skills and the workforce to fill those kinds of jobs. Science, technology, engineering, and math on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that's all for this week. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next time. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.